How's everybody doing tonight? You know what? It's, it's been a little while um, since I told you I loved you. And, and I do. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I started this, this trip off, and I remember asking, like, man, I've had a really cool life. What am I doing here? Like, why, why am I here? And um, I'm, I'm going to tell you, uh, I, think, I think the sermon tonight is, might be for me. Um, I'm going to go totally off script for a second, if you'll let me, because there's several things that have happened today that are absolutely miraculous, and if we're talking about the presence of Jesus uh, in our lives, um, I'm having what I call a thin space. I call it thin spaces because there are times in my life that I can recall where heaven and earth were very, very close, and I got to experience being very close to him. So do y'all mind if I just share some things that have happened Today, like in the last little bit, so my day started off with a um, with a text from a, a woman named Shelley Ulrich. She's um, the woman counterpart to our ministry at um, at Real Life Ministries Texas, and she knows that I agonized over the whole sermon club thing that we did today. Um, I agonized over it because I was like, man, I I don't know. It's kind of risky. I mean, what if they don't say anything, right? So I agonized over it, and she, she texted, and she's like, all right, warrior, take the risk, go for it, I'm praying for you, I got you. We did the sermon club thing, and it was awesome. The participation in this room was off the chain. I mean, I'm, I'm just so unbelievably proud, and I'm so glad that I did it, because y'all didn't know that I agonized about it, but I agonized about it. So there's one. Two, um, we sang It Is Well With My Soul. And I, I told him I wasn't going to be singing tonight because I am kind of put myself on a voluntary vocal rest. And, uh, well, I broke it. Because <laughs> when we sang that song, um, I know the bass part of that really, really well. And it's been a while since I've been able to dial that up. And that felt awesome. In addition to that, we sang No Longer a Slave to Fear. Now, I've got a story about that song. Uh, when I was in Africa, we were doing this goodbye thing at this men's conference, and so there was about a 1,000 men uh, lined up uh, in a big circle, and we were singing that song. And as we were singing that song, all of these men kept going, I have a word from the Lord, and then they would give a word from the Lord, and then I guess everybody felt like they needed a word from the Lord. And then they would say, let's sing a few more verses or let's sing that a few more times. And so what was supposed to be a 15-minute goodbye turned out to be about three hours singing that song. <laughs> to which I almost said, I have a word from the Lord. He's giving no more words from the Lord. Mm. <laughs> this is a true story. I, did, I didn't do that. Mm. But I almost did. But for whatever reason, singing that song tonight in this setting rescued that song for me. And thank you for that. And then you went and did In the Garden. Because that's my mom's favorite song too. And she has gone to be with the Lord about seven years ago. And she would be so proud of me being here tonight talking to our people. Gosh, she would be so, she'd be like, I can't believe you're doing that, but here, here we go. I'm having a thin space. I feel like goodness and mercy are trailing me like a pack of dogs. And that may be why well, I'm, I'm here. Yeah, I thought I was here for you, but maybe, maybe I was here for that. And so, if, I mean, if y'all are cool with it, anybody that goes to this church, if y'all could get me like 12 stones, so I can build a monument right there. And y'all have to leave it. <laughs> y'all have to leave it there because, you know, when I come back, I want it to be there. So that's, that's happening uh, after this. Um, and is everybody okay with that? Okay, we can talk. Yeah. All right. So, um, I mean, I want it right there. Thank you guys for that. And so since it's the last night, there's, there's a couple of things. Like, 
you're going to see between the sermon club, uh, between the worship that this man put together every night. So he, he reached out to me like a while back and said, you know what you're going to be talking about? I was like, it was a while back. I was like, well, yes, I know what I'm going to be talking about. I sent it, and I think I even threw in a let's go. And everything that he's dialed up has been on par with everything that we've done. And wait until you hear this tonight. And then the sermon club is, is right on par with that. And the light of the world, you're going to hear it like it's in there. And, like, I don't believe in coincidences anymore. I don't. I sit there and go, well, that's a thin space. I ought to build a monument monument, put it right there. I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with this. We're doing this. And, um, and I just want to give a shout-out to one more person. Um, well, actually, two. Um, my man, Garrett, other, the little guy that walked in. The sound guy? Nobody gives love to the sound guy. Mm. But being the sound guy is a, is a thankless job uh, because, it, you know, nobody kind of even notices until, like, somebody gets up there with a mic and they're like. And then everybody in the, you know, looks back there. And so I just want to show love to God. He's not even here. See, I'm giving the guy love. He's not even in here. Mm. And then I also want to thank Megan. Um, Megan has been awesome with the slides and um, just, just really, really pleased with all that. So I just, I, yeah. And so I'm really pleased with all of you. So what you're about to hear is a sermon um, that, was, that was helped to be created uh, by many of the people in this room. And, and I did it kind of as a, as a teaching because when we talk about being disciple-making churches, one of the big things is, is sermon prep takes an awful long time, or it can. And so if we are going to move from being preachers to equippers, then sometimes we need um, to do something differently. Uh, so that we can actually do that. And what uh, I want you all to know that Sermon Club isn't. It's not like I'm, you know, getting a bunch of people in the room to write it for me. I'm like, I wrote this. But remember when I talked to you about last night about taking people with me? This is a way that I can disciple as I'm going. Because sometimes I have to preach. And when I have to preach, we can bring people in the room and I can bring them with me. Does that make sense? So that's what this is all about. So if you don't like anything that I say tonight, we've already worshipped Jesus. I can tank the whole thing, but y'all helped me write it, so <laughs> it's on you. Um, I'm really looking forward to presenting this one to you, and I hope you are too. So um, I haven't told a, a football story in the sermon yet, so here, here's a football story. Um, as many of you know, um, I was a football coach. It's not a mystery now. Um, and, and it was a ministry for me. And, and one of the ways that I, really the product of the whole thing, if you want to know, if, if somebody played for four, with me for four years, I instructed them, them in manhood things, uh, put them through hard times in order for them to discover things about themselves, and taught them how to be a good teammate and all of those kind of things. But, the, but really the product was, it came at the very end, that when you were a senior, you went uh, to a banquet. And I would, by the way, this was training for the dads, too. Because at that banquet, what I would do is I would tell the dads that they are going to bless their sons publicly. And I gave them a little script so nobody out-blessed anybody else. But the content was, I mean, well, they, they all kind of said the same thing, but the content was different. But, but the flow was the same. Because you wouldn't believe how hard a time that some of the dads had with that. Like, Coach, can't you just do it? Well, yeah, I could do it. But it would mean so much more coming from you. So just think about what you always wanted your dad to say to you, and then you say it to your boy. Right? And ultimately, really what that was, it was, it was I was training the dads to be blessers. I was training the young men to receive blessing. And then uh, while the dad was standing there next to the son, the boys would bless the, the young man sitting in the chair. And like it was a, a picture of God's economy, because I'm going to tell you, I never get tired of blessing. And you, you really won't either, I promise. Like, if, if it's something that you do, it's like the more you shovel it out in small shovels, the more God shoves it back into you with big shovels. Like, I, I've never been like, you know, I'm just tired of blessing people today. <laughs> right? It, it seems like the more I do it, the more energy I have to do it. And so uh, we would do this, and it was a really beautiful thing. And, and um, you know, it, it, 
it just it was healing for me to to because I'm going to tell you when the boy would stand up after receiving that from his father and from the boys, his job was to come up and then bless the team and then pass something down, and they always stood a little differently, and it was cool. And so then what would happen is is I didn't want to out bless their dads, so I would come up to them and pull them to the side, and I would speak to them. I would, and I would say some things that were very personal. Man. All right. And I would, I would always end what I said with, I'll never be done with you. You hear me? Yeah, Pastor, I hear you. All right. I'll never be done with you. So, um, here recently, uh, well, I guess it's been a little while now, I officiated the funeral of one of my players. Um, he passed, he's, he was 20 years old, and I knew it was going to be hard, and um, I knew that a lot of my former guys were going to be there, and um, I, I had to like psychologically prepare just to give it, and, and I did, and it was, it was great, and it was honoring, and then I knew I was going to have to like clean up some messes in the hearts and minds of s some of my guys. And so I did. I did the thing, and I was Coach Nelson to them again. And, um, and I was able to speak to them and kind of hold them up and remember, remember everything that we said, and we're going to see him again. And if we have any hope at all, just remember what I taught you. If you want to see him again, you, ha you have a chance. And, you know, there was this, it was healing. It was beautiful. We hugged, and I walked away. I started walking away. And one of the boys uh, yelled, Hey, Coach. I was like, yeah, what's up? He goes, I'll never be done with you. And I remember how that landed in my soul uh, to hear my own words spoken back to me. And he meant it too. And in that moment, a covenant had been established. A childhood wound had been healed in some kind of way for me. Um, the messaging I always receive from the thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy, to me, what he says to me is, you're on your own. You're on your own. You're, nobody cares. You're on your own. It doesn't matter what you do. You're on your own. And so, for the first time in a long time, I didn't feel like I was on my own. Remember when, me telling you about the day I've been having? Well, I had a young man call me while I was back at the hotel writing this sermon. I'm going to build a monument. A um, young man called me and said, Coach, I'm getting married. Man, Thomas, that's, that's great, bud. He goes, yeah, uh, and, and my girlfriend and I were talking, and we would like for you to perform the wedding. Okay, well, I'll be happy to do that. It's not like tomorrow, is it? No. Um, hmm. He goes, no, June of 2024. So I'm like, whew, I got a year. All right. That gives me time to counsel them because I don't do weddings without it. Um, and uh, before he got off the phone, guess what he said? Coach, I'll never be done with you. Whew, that was today. I'm building a monument. Mm. <laughs> so I hope all of you have had a similar encounter where your soul has been anchored like mine was. <laughs> it is. It's a rough world out there. It's messy. An unhealthy relationship here, a rejection there. Throw in a little bit of church hurt, maybe a divorce in the past. A loss on the horizon can make the world an incredibly lonely place. It can force us into a situation where we want to wall up to protect ourselves, to self-isolate. And We can live in this cave, but there is no life in the cave. The I am on my own or the we are on our own mindset does not come from the voice of the good shepherd. It is the voice of the thief that we are hearing, and it comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and it is a lie from the pit of hell. The voice of the good shepherd says something that is completely the opposite of this. So let's take a look, especially when it comes to disciple making. So once again, I'm going to start by reading the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Um, it's, we've heard it every single night. We're going to hear it again, but it says this, then Jesus came to them and said, 
All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nation, nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Look at that last line again. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So consider the context of this situation. He's making this promise to those he has entrusted to advance his kingdom. Them and us. I want to make a distinction here about um, Jesus being with us until the end of the age. You know, I I see t-shirts and things like that that say, like, Jesus is my homeboy. No, 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 no. No. See, because your homeboy is your is your guy that regardless of what you do and whatever sin you produce or whatever, like, yeah, I'll, I'm with you, man. I'm with We're cool. That isn't Jesus. We good? All right. Yeah, thank you. How's that sound, everybody? All right. Dude, that sound guy, I'm telling you. Hmm. Look at that. And where's the Kleenex? Is that from the sound guy too? Man, that dude is on fire. What a serious part of the sermon here. Mm. Um, so Jesus isn't our homeboy. And that promise is for the, to, to let us know that when we go advance his kingdom, he's with us. We are under his authority. And we're under the authority that he's given us. So I just want to remind us that Jesus is our king. The king of a kingdom the king of a kingdom that he's asked us to advance. And he's telling us to advance it under his authority. Now, this phrase begins, uh, depending on what version you use, it either uses the word, lo, I am with you until the end of the age, or it says, behold, I am with you until the end of the age. And, you know, I've tried to stay away from it all the the whole time, and, you know, well, the Greek for that is, you know, we do that all the time, and, and sometimes it's useful and sometimes it isn't. But in this particular case, it's useful. Uh, it's the Greek word idu, which means um, behold or lo. And it happens about 160 times in the New Testament. And typically after it's used, like something pretty significant happens. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Like after Jesus' baptism, it says, behold, the heavens were open and the Spirit descended as a dove. Um, Behold, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Uh, After Jesus' temptation, it says, behold, angels came to minister him. So anytime there's like a behold, there's something big that follows it. Lo or behold. And in this particular case, Jesus is making a very significant promise. Behold, I am with you till the end of the age. So here's what the phrase assures us as we go out making disciples the first thing it assures us of is his covenant okay and and i need to explain what a covenant is um a lot of times people think it's a promise but it's more than a promise um there's a difference and so uh, the best way i can think of to define this for you is the difference between a contract and a covenant okay so in a contract situation it's like this um you do something for me and i do something for you Kind of like my cell phone bill, my cell phone company, right? Um, I give them money. They ask me for more money. No, no, no. No, they did in Canada. <laughs> no, uh, I give them money. They give me service. It's how it works. They give, if they don't give me service, what do I do? I don't give them money. It's a contract, Right? I don't have a covenant with my cell company. I will leave them in a heartbeat if they don't hold up their end of the deal. And I could turn this into a marriage teaching real quick, because by the way, marriages are covenants, not contracts. The difference between a contract and a covenant is, when I'm in a covenant, what I'm saying to you is, I will hold up my end of the deal even when you don't. And that sounds like I'm inviting myself to be a doormat, but really what I'm doing is I'm being incredibly powerful, like whatever, I'm going to hold up my end of the deal because this is a covenant. 
And Jesus, by saying this, is reminding these Jewish boys of covenants that he has had over the course of time. He made a similar covenant with Moses. He made a similar uh, kind of to prolong that covenant. As I was with Moses, I am with you, Joshua. Right? He's, he said it multiple times. And so was the promise only for them? No. How do we know? Because it's not the end of the age. <laughs> the, the apostles died the deaths that they did. Is it the end of the age? Absolutely not. We're still here. So who's the promise for? Us. So, um, so Jesus is with us. In fact, we are living, and you've heard me say this, and I just want to say this again before I go and build my monument. We are living in the greatest manifestation of God possible. Consider this verse from John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. The Holy Spirit in the Bible and the church is the greatest manifestation of God. And how many times have we told ourselves we'd be better off if we were like with the patriarchs? How many times have we told ourselves we were better off if we were with Jesus? And you've heard me say, if you've been at all nine sessions now, that Peter would be like, wait, y'all have got it way better. You've got it way better. The last days are the best of times indeed, and Jesus promised to be with us until it's over. Let us praise his name for that. The other thing that we're assured of in this is his companionship. You know, uh, I know why my mother loved that song so much. Uh, in the garden, his companionship. And this is a hard one to explain because um, many of you, uh, sometimes I don't feel like Jesus is my companion. Sometimes I don't feel him. Um, and almost every single time that that is, I'm usually in the middle of some kind of rebellion or disobedience. But this is hard because Jesus' Jesus's presence isn't always easy to feel. And we would like for it to feel like it did in Paul in, uh, to Paul in Acts 18. If you remember, he gets rejected uh, by the Jews and, and those kind of things. And Jesus actually speaks to him. He says, do not be afraid, uh, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. Y'all remember that story? It's a good story. Um, but the thing about it is, is when I look back on my life, I have had that similar nudge where Jesus has spoken those kind of things into me. It may not have been this audible thing, but I may have been heading into something. You don't need to go in there. You don't need to engage in this. Or, conversely, see that man over there, you need to go talk to him. Just raise your hand. Anybody? I know you're not supposed to do that. Yeah, just raise your hand. So, um, What's interesting is the word always is used. I'm with you always. My companionship always. And if I get big on the Greek again, the, the word that's used there means each one of the days. So that means like today I have his companionship. Tomorrow I have his companion. Each one of the days. So long as it's called today, right? So um, I would ask that you consider Matthew 18, 20. It says this, for where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am with him. I want y'all to know, in addition to everything that I've already reported today, I've experienced Jesus today through one of my friends, Greg Granger, sitting up there. Because if you notice, my throat is killing me. Um, and I prayed last night, like I actually prayed, like I envisioned the Holy Spirit touching me on the throat and healing me, like I need to be healed so I can do this sermon. Guess what Greg Granger does this morning? Can I get you any cough drops? And he went and got them, right? So it didn't look like this super finger from the sky touching my thing, or touching my throat. But, um, but what we got instead was Greg Granger getting me cough drops, and I'm up here preaching a sermon today. Answered prayer, like Christ with me. It sounds weird, but uh, notice how he ties his presence with the presence of our, our uh, with others. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is what it means to be rooted and established in his love so we can comprehend it. Greg Granger showed me the love of Christ today. This is, um, if you are not feeling his presence, consider the relationship you have with others. 
We live in a time where we feel like spiritual maturity is having enough knowledge that we no longer need anyone. The opposite is true. You've heard me say this. I'm going to keep banging that drum. The more spiritually mature we become, the more we seek his presence by gathering with others. It is true that we have a personal relationship with Jesus in the fact that he knows us by our name personally. However, the, only, uh, the way you know if you have a personal relationship with Jesus is by how you love others. And that comes from John chapter 13, verse 35. He's no longer walking on the earth, but his hands and feet are. We can feel his presence anytime. And the last thing that this promise assures us is his consistent consistency. He said, until the end of the age, and I just want to go back over what I said again, like God in every manifestation of himself has been consistent in I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, be strong and courageous, I am with you, I am with you, I am with you. And since this is until the end of the age and we're still here, he is still with us. He's still in control. And when will he stop being with us? Well, maybe uh, 1 Thessalonians verse 4, or chapter 4, verses uh, 16 and 17 says this. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So I guess even at the end of this age, we're going to have another better age. How about that? I get pretty excited about that. You? Yeah. So I guess he's just going to be with us till forever. And I don't know about you, but I'm okay with that. So the Lord is so consistent, it seems that he will even be with us in the age to come. Amen. So what does that mean for us? What that means for us is we can't lose. We are on the winning side. Ladies and gentlemen, we have nothing to fear. We merely have to play the game. Here is the hope of this promise, and I couldn't sum it up any better than Paul does in Romans, it's Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. And I'm not going to be able to read it all, but I'm going to give you the highlights, and I think we've got it on the screen. So here is how advantageous of this manifestation of God is that we are in with Christ being with us every day. So here's the hope. Number one, the Holy Spirit prays for us when we don't even know what to pray. Have you thought about how advantageous that is? Like, if you don't even know what to pray, just start here. Lord, I don't know what to pray, so you're just going to have to do it. Holy Spirit, pray for me. Groan on my behalf, because I don't even know. Okay? That's in verse 26 and 27. I invite you to look that up yourself. Um, verse 28 says this, that God is actively working things out for our good. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty awesome promise, and I don't always see it, but I can think of multiple times in my life. I told you a story today in which I look at things in the rearview mirror, and I go, man, that stunk, but man, I'm glad I'm here. I'm, I wouldn't have gotten here without that. God works things out for our good. Do you believe that? Verse 32 says that God will graciously give us all we need. Doesn't mean he's going to give me a Lamborghini, but he's going to give me what I need to carry out his mission. Lamborghini would be cool too, but it's not probably not going to happen because it's not necessary. I got a 2007 Tundra; it runs great. <laughs> um, he will give us all that we need. Verse 33 says this: No one can bring a charge against us. And think about that for a second. Think about the things that we will not do for no other reason than we're afraid somebody's going to say something about us. And the promise is like, who condemns? I'm the one that condemns. They can't condemn you. Right? That's a pretty amazing promise, don't you think? Number five, um, no one will condemn you. There's that, I just kind of followed up to what I said. That's in verse 34. So we can't, nobody can bring a charge against us. Nobody can condemn us. And Romans 8, 35 says, nothing will separate you from the love of Christ. And that, I get pretty excited when I think about that. And so verses 37 through 39 say this, know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, listen to this, that neither li uh, death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth 
nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is with us until the end of the age. I don't, I don't know how it gets any better. So I can sum up the entire application in this one sentence. Ladies and gentlemen, church of Jesus Christ, it is time for us to live like we know we're saved. It is time to wear our salvation like a helmet. I know that when I used to put helmets on my athletes, they behaved differently than when they were not wearing helmets. They became like missiles, right? It's time for us to start wearing our salvation like a helmet. He will never be done with us. He is with us until the end of the age. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the end of this lectureship. And this is my, the ninth time many of you heard me speak. And I'm just going to sum up everything that I hope you've heard me say. We are sowers working in Jesus' kingdom. We must spread the seed broadly, bountifully, and boldly because only a small percentage will land on good soil. The good soil will bring an increase. The more sowers, the more increase. So therefore, um, pastors, ministers in the room, we need to equip our people to be sowers. As churches and individuals, we must be the good soil ourselves. How do we know what kind of soil we are? The fruit we produce. If you are not producing fruit, you are not good soil. And we must repent. Once we have a crop, expect the enemy to sow weeds. Be watchful, stand firm, act like men, be strong, do everything in love to keep that from happening. The church is a big deal. It is not a holy huddle. It is the mechanism by which the manifold wisdom of God is revealed to the world and to the authorities and principalities. The angels don't, don't share this with us. We share it with them. For us to be able to know the love of Christ has for us, we must be rooted and established with all the saints. We must be locked in and on the same mission. Once we are rooted and established ourselves, we are able to help others. And the synergy created allows us to experience the fullness of God. And to be full of God, we must be fully empty of ourselves. God is able to do more than we can ask or think. To him be glory in the church. The church's job is to bring him glory throughout all generations. If we are still here, then we are not done which leads us to this, the Great Commission. All authority has been given to Jesus. We are in the best possible hands. He doesn't walk on the earth, but we do as his hands and feet. His spirit resides within us. We need to quit being pessimistic and remember that we win. He's got us. To do anything different than what he asked us to do is treason against the kingdom. We must go. And as we go, we must be sure to take, make sure everyone knows about the kingdom. The outcome is not on us. For, that, for those that believe, we must baptize, but it doesn't stop there. We must teach them to obey all that he has commanded until the Great Commission comes full circle and they are equipped to release and make their own disciples. This is the target. This is the win, not just conversion. Lastly, Jesus is with us through everything. We don't have to have all the answers. There is nothing to fear and nothing can touch us. His presence is always available and we can see it manifest when we gather as believers. So I want to leave you with this encouragement because it seems like it's really dark out there. John chapter 1 verses 4 through 5 says this about Jesus. In him was life and the life was the light of the men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. This is still true for us today. No matter how dark and dead it may seem out there, it has not overcome Christ. There is no such thing as post-Christian. And if you are in Christ, don't let it overcome you either. Don't follow the voice of the thief. You are a city on a hill. You are a, a lamp on the lampstand. Can you believe the coincidence? Don't hide it under a bushel. Live the resurrected life because the power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Romans 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I have a call to action for you. 
and I wrote it, and so um, this may be terrible. Like, I've got a new development where I don't see very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But your call to action, I may have to read it up there with you guys. Pray God, will, and, and I want you all to do this. It's going to sound a lot uh, like last night, but during Sermon Club today, some of them kind of sounded the same, so we're going with it. Pray God will reveal one person, three people, and 12 people to disciple and write them down, like actually write them down and start praying for them. Think of places you can take them with you and invite them. So once you've identified your bullseye like you're one, invite them to go somewhere with you. And just see how it goes. You don't even have to do anything. You don't have to say, hey, this is a, by the way, this is a discipling relationship. No, just, just listen to them. Ask probing questions. Be curious. Listen to what they say, those phrases from the stage, and you'll know where they are. And they'll probably be honored that somebody actually cares about them. Because there's a lot of people with the message, I'm on my own. And lastly, and I really want you to do this. Confess to another an area of your life where you've been disobedient. So you can feel his presence and be healed. I hope you have someone in your life that you can do that to. Because oftentimes when we feel far from God, it's not him who left us. We left him. So ladies and gentlemen, um, the fullness of God is at hand, and it's time for us to experience it. And we must empty ourselves out so that we can. We will see greater things here in Canada, here in the United States, here in North America, and around the world. I uh, had the experience of watching my number two daughter graduate from Harding University. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, she she's a nurse. She's a nurse now. I'm proud of her. She's off the payroll. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> um, but she, um, the president of the university said this really cool thing. He said, uh, he was talking about bison. And I actually knew this. Like before he said it, I was like, he's about to say that. But he talked about, you know, bison. When you see pictures of bison, they, you know, they're hardy looking and they always got snow on their face. You know, they're all, I mean, they're, they don't look like deer. Like, they, they look like bison. And one of the things is he said that's interesting about bison is they're different from all the other animals because whereas other animals, when they detect a storm, they'll run away from it. Do you know what bison do? They run towards it to get through it faster. There's a storm out there, but it's time for us to go. It's time for us to go into the storm. He has all the authority. He's with us. It's time for us to go for ourselves, for our church, for our families, in our workplace, and for his glory. Let's go. It has been my joy to be with all of you. And if I haven't said it in a minute, I love you. Let's pray. Holy God, uh, just forgive us when we don't believe what you, the, the covenants that you have with us. We know that you always hold up your end of the deal even when we don't. So Father, help us to live like we know we are saved. May your kingdom advance and may your kingdom come. It's in Jesus' victorious name we pray. Amen.